everybody. Welcome to the next exciting instalment of the Texas Instruments Australia webinar series. Tonight's session is exam readiness and mathematical methods. Our two extremely experienced presenters are Hayley Duro and Peter Flynn. Now, Hayley is a mathematics teacher at Mount Waverley College. And she presents workshops at her school and local schools and math associations in Victoria and also has co-presented at TQ International in the USA. Our second presenter is Peter Flynn. He's an experienced presenter and he's an educational technology consultant for TI Australia. And um, if you have a question, you can always email Peter, who readily shares his knowledge and experience with schools and various state conferences in Australia and overseas. Now, throughout the evening, um, watching the webinar, if you actually have a question you'd like to pose to the uh, presenters or myself, if you move your cursor to the top middle of your screen, you'll actually see a drop-down menu and you'll see the question and answers and chat spaces. If you've got a question, click on the chat icon and post your questions to myself, Rodney Anderson, who is the host for the evening. And, and through the evening, we'll, I'll be checking the questions and I'll pose the questions to the presenters. After the webinar, um, You'll be sent an email in the next two days of the webinar and that will have the link to print your certificate and also the resources to download. So we'll just pass over to Hayley now. Hayley's going to start the first session and have a good session, Hayley. Thanks, Rodney. Just checking, you can see my desktop, Rodney. It's on, yep, you're cooking with gas as they Fantastic. say. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, good evening everyone and as Rodney said my name is Hayley Duro and I'm a methods teacher at Mount Waverley Secondary College in Melbourne in Victoria. Uh, so in today's session uh, I'll be using, as you can see, the, uh, uh, the software, another TI Inspire uh, software and this is what I use in my classes. Uh, when I'm showing students how to how to use their TI Inspire. So I will be doing the first part of tonight's webinar and then I'll be handing over to Peter Flynn. And to start off with, I'm just going to go through some basic navigation. So what I would show my Year 12s uh, in terms of using their handheld in an exam. So this is something that I think is really important that we explicitly teach the students how to navigate around different pages in their handheld. Um, and sometimes I find that this isn't necessarily taught to them as an explicit skill and then often when I maybe get them in Year 12, uh, they haven't actually been shown uh, how to do this. So I'm just going to show you here, if we press Control and then Up, you can see uh, the pages that I have, have open here. And you'll notice that it goes from problem one and then I've got down here problem two. Now I'll just jump back into this problem and the kids can also see that view on their handheld just by pressing control and up. So this document here is 1.1, the next one 1.2, 1.3, etc. If I want to add another page into this problem, the shortcut is control and I. So control I is insert and you'll see here that I can add a page, let's add a calculator page perhaps. And these pages are really talking to one another. So if I were to, for example, uh, define a function, and I'm going to use the assign key here, so control and this button here will bring up the assign function. Let's call this function maybe just x squared. Okay, that's done. So it's now assigned or defined in my CAS, I can evaluate G of 1, for example, or G of 20. If I were to now insert a graphing page using Control i again, so Control and I, and insert a graph, then these pages will uh, talk to one another. So rather than typing in x squared here, I'm just going to go back to this page and, okay, I've defined my function as G of x, and so I can put G of x in here. Another way to recall the function is to press the var key. So if I press var, I'll be able to see any functions that I have assigned in my CAS. So if I click in g of x, 
there we go, and it's plotted the function. So this is really useful for the students to know, particularly in their methods exam, the extended answer exam. If they were to get a long extended answer question with a big, uh, perhaps a circular function uh, given to them, they could define or assign the function in here and then they can simply just graph it in one step in another page. And they could keep inserting pages uh, linked to this first problem, 1.4, 1.5, etc. Now in the exam we know that they may get up to five extended answer questions, plus they have all of their multiple choice uh, questions to answer. So rather than deleting all of these pages out when we want to start the next problem, we can just simply insert a new problem. So to do that, we go up to Doc, and I'm going to insert, so that was Doc and then insert, and rather than inserting a new page, you can see the shortcut there, this time I'm going to insert a new problem. And if I jump into problem 2.1 and I click the VAR key, you can see that this problem doesn't recognise any of the functions that I may have defined in other problems. So I can start fresh again. This is particularly useful if perhaps two of the questions on exam two used f of x or f of t uh, so that the kids don't get muddled. They can just jump between problems here and then at any stage they can press control up and they can see any problems that they have uh, open on their calculator. So that's just um, a useful thing that I think is, is worthwhile showing the kids um, because they can in fact go into their exam their second exam, with this all set up. So I'm just going to jump across to this other document here. I've named this one exam two. And the kids can create this document or something similar and easily save it into their handheld and then take this document into exam two, all before the exam's even started because we know that their handhelds don't get cleared. So they could have this document open. And if we press control up here, we can see I've just set out problem one, problem two, problem three, problem four, etc. Uh, and they could, of course, insert a new problem. This would be blank. I was just playing around. So they'd just have to go to doc and insert a new problem. And then you can see now we've got five big problems uh, all open for them before they go into the exam. So that's the beauty of setting up those, those problems. Of course, they can save their document at any time, just pressing control and save and uh, that will save the document if it hasn't already been sa saved, this one has. Okay, so that's a little bit of navigation. At any stage, if they insert a page that they don't want, and that's something that happens often, uh, my kids will accidentally insert a page and then they don't want one, they don't want that page, they just click on Doc, and then they can go to Edit, uh, sorry, Page Layout, and delete the page, so that's useful as well. If for some reason they're on the home screen here, uh, and this happens sometimes when the kids are fiddling around with their settings, and then they want to get back to the document that they were just working on, they could just click here on cut, and that will take them back. Often when the kids go to the home screen, they accidentally add a new page because they'll click there and add a page there, so that's just something to show them as well. They just need to click on current. Okay, that's a bit for, that's probably enough on navigation. Uh, the other thing that's really important to discuss with your students going into the exam is just about their settings. So we have many kids that are doing further maps and methods, and the settings are often different if you're doing further maps as well. So let's just go into settings. Um, this is also a good chance to get the kids to check that they've got the right uh, the right software. So they should all be working on 4.0 and that's sort of a nice little way to hint to them if they haven't updated their software. Uh, 3.9 is I guess okay, there weren't huge differences but that's certainly worth updating. Um, if the kids are working on anything before that then uh, they're missing out on a lot of, of excellent functions so get them to update to 4.0. Okay, back into settings. If we go to document settings now, uh, I always encourage my methods kids to have their float up nice and high 
11 might be a bit extreme, but not going to hurt. They should, of course, have their angle in radian, not degree. So if they're switching between further and methods, uh, it's always a good idea just to remind them of that. I had a student who completed almost half of a method sack recently in degree, and she was a bit devastated. So uh, just get them to be mindful of that. And I just wanted to touch on this one here, the calculation mode. So there seems to be a little bit of confusion, uh, at least amongst my students, as to which one, uh, sorry, I'm just getting a message there, which one to use in methods. So we want our uh, handheld set to auto, and I'll show you why. Let's just show a little example as to why we don't have it in exact, even though methods teachers love exact answers. So I'm just going to tab it there and press OK. So I've set my handheld to exact now. Now what I'll do is consider the function x squared uh, and another function to the power of x. So if we were trying to solve this equation uh, using the solve function, we, we all know that we can see by inspection two solutions uh, and we can imagine the graphs if I got a graph page up and plotted them, you'd be able to see they intersect uh, three times. So we're expecting three solutions uh, to this equation. And if I press Enter now, uh, you can see that I don't actually get any solutions. So this is all to do with the settings. If I jump back into settings now and just change my settings to uh, auto, what auto will do is it will give me a, an exact answer if the equation has an exact answer, but it will give me uh, a decimal approximation if it doesn't. So auto is the setting that we want our kids using for methods just to ensure that they don't miss any solutions to equations. So I'll press OK. I'll press current now to jump back into the uh, problem, and I'll just go up and highlight that and press the Enter key. And if I press enter again now, you can see this time it's giving me uh, my solutions, which is lovely. Also, when I was talking about the mode, I mentioned making sure that the kids have their CAS in, sorry, their handheld in Radian. And you can see up the top here, this is new in version uh, 4.0, the new software. The screen actually shows the, the students which mode they're in, which is really, really lovely. So um, yep, yeah, there's just a few things in settings. Nice high float, uh, your mode in radian and also your uh, auto setting instead of your exact. Okay, uh, the next thing I'll touch on is just some useful commands. So I've made a little list here. Uh, we won't get time to have a look at all of these commands, but I tried to do a bit of a brainstorm with my students about the the functions that they, or the commands that they use most frequently in methods questions. So here's a bit of a list, and I'll just touch on a couple of these uh, today. We'll see how much how much time we have. So I'm just going to insert a new page here. I'll use my little shortcut that the kids love, Control I, and I might just insert a calculator page. Let's start with something that we're all pretty familiar with, something like uh, solve. And of course, I've just typed that in because I'm on a computer. Uh, the shortcut is menu 31. The kids tend to figure that one out pretty quickly. Uh, so menu 31 will get you to solve. And let's solve a nice uh, quadratic uh, equation. Remember that you need to put, uh, sorry, Type the wrong thing in there. You need to just put comma x at the end, and you need to make it an equation, which I've just forgotten to do. So let's uh, make that an equation and put comma x on the end. And you can see it's lovely that the TI Inspire tells you when you type the wrong thing in, uh, and I get my true solutions there. So of course I've chosen a very basic equation. You can use the solve function for all sorts of uh, functions, and Let's have a look now if we use the solve function to solve maybe uh, sine of x equals a half. Okay, so of course what we're expecting here is general solutions because I haven't uh, restricted Haley, the domain. Sorry to interrupt there. 
what you did there was okay. great using the control divide to get the fraction templates and it's very good to see that on the calculator to see one half written as a rational number. It's a very nice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. And I often encourage my kids to uh, type, even if they're given, maybe if they were given 0.7 there, just to put it in as 7 tenths. But that's just to do with you know, the way that then their solutions come out on the screen. So yeah, True. thanks for that. Yeah. Um, so what we can see here are general solutions. We're expecting those. If we want to restrict the domain, we just type in uh, using the given that key. So that was control and equals there. And I'll use this key, given that key. And I might put a uh, restriction on the domain here. So on a computer, I can actually type in minus two pi like that. Obviously, the kids need to use the uh, pi symbol. So I'll use the pi symbol uh, on the handheld here for the benefit. There we go. So there we can click in pi. And now that I've restricted that domain there, uh, I'll get a nice long list of solutions there. And I did this one on purpose. I, I made a really large domain so that we could get lots of solutions because this is one thing the kids don't like is when their solutions come up in a big list and they need to scroll across. So there's a couple of hints here. One is if you press control and one, that will take you to the end of the list and control seven will take you to the front. So that's almost like saying, take me to the bottom and take me to the top. But another really useful command that I encourage my students to use is instead of using the solve command, you can use the zeros command. So zeros, I can type it in here. Uh, you can also access the zeros command from the catalog. So if I press the catalog here, that book button and a Z, it will take me down to zeros. And let's uh, solve the, the first equation again. I typed in this quadratic equation plus six. And sorry, it was five. There we go. And when I typed this equation in using the solve command, I had to make sure that it was an equation. And then I put comma X. The zeros command recognizes that you're setting this to zero. So we don't need to write equal zero or anything like that. We just press comma X. And this is saying, um, tell me where this uh, expression here, I guess, is equal to zero. And the benefit of this is that our uh, solution here comes out in a set like that, which is really lovely. So how is this useful up here with this circular function example? If I were to, again, use the zeros command and try and get these solutions in a set, I'd need to solve this equation, um, so transpose this equation so that one side of the equation was equal to zero. So what I would have is sine x minus a half, and I'll type that in there, comma x. Of course, that's I need really to put good, that... Hayley. Sorry to interrupt there, Hayley. That's a really good feature to show people about the zeros, the difference not needing the equals versus the solve. Mm, yeah, show, the, the kids love it, uh, particularly uh, when they they get long lists of solutions like that. And this becomes really useful later when you're finding uh, coordinates of stationary points because you can actually get the solutions, I'll just show you here, up in a set like this. And then you can even, uh, you can even substitute those in. So from memory, I had defined g as x squared. Uh, let me just make sure I've done that. So let's say if I wanted to evaluate um, g of x at all of these x values, and I'm just sort of getting a bit, going on a bit of a tangent here, but I can in fact paste all of those values into a function, and it will evaluate the function value for, for those values. So that's particularly useful when you have to find uh, coordinates of stationary points or perhaps it's a long extended answer question where you're finding, um, I'm trying to think, where you're finding the time at which the, the height of the water is 10 or something and you wanted to check your values. So um, yeah, the zeros command is a really nice one to show the kids. Um, and as Rodney said, we just need to make sure that they know uh, it's comma x and you don't need to make that an equation. Okay, uh, another useful command. I'll just open a new page here. Uh, another useful command is the domain command. And a lot of the students don't tend to know that this one exists. 
Again, I could type in domain or I can access that from the catalog. And if I, uh, I went to E so that I can scroll up to domain. And this function here uh, allows me to find the domain. Let's just type in maybe a hyperbola, something like that. I do need to press a comma X at the end. And so we know that the domain is all real values except for three there. If we press enter here, the, uh, the handheld will tell us that as well. Um, and uh, of course, if we have defined a function like I had, uh, I can just type in the main of g of x and it will tell me that my domain is uh, all real values. So it might not come out exactly how the kids would normally write it because I would not encourage my students to write all real values like that. Uh, but it's certainly a nice little function that the, the kids can use um, if they're double checking, particularly in, in multiple choice questions. I think they tend to find that pretty useful. Uh, also, if you're working with graphs of derivatives and the derivative is perhaps not defined at certain points, maybe a, a vertex or an endpoint, um, this function is a nice way of checking over which domain your derivative function uh, exists. So that's another little little hint there. But So it, that command is domain, then you put in your function, comma x. And if you were doing a problem with t, you just use comma t, of course. Okay, um, there was one more I wanted to show you back with this solving example. So let's, let's paste that back in. Um, often multiple choice questions might say something like the number of solutions to this equation is. And we can see here one, two, three, four, five, six solutions. Uh, six is okay, we can probably count that without using a handheld, but there is a nice little function that is the count function. So if we go to count, and again that's in our list, or we can type it in, and if you count the number of items in that set, it will tell you that there are um, six. So that's a nice little trick as well. Um, and I thought in today's session, rather than going through, you know, an extended answer question bit by bit by bit, um, I just cover some useful commands um, to start with that the kids can use in any question really because these things come up a lot. Okay, another one is uh, the shortcut for derivative and antiderivative. So if we use shift and minus, that will bring up um, this little derivative here and we can type in g of x. I might just jump across to this document here. I'd actually prepared a bit of a function here. Uh, let's scroll up to problem three. Sorry, problem two. Okay, so there we have, uh, I've just defined a circular function question. This might be you know, the height of the wave at time t. And so if the student has assigned the function, and I did that using the assign command, they can just press control and minus, and this will of course be d dt, f of t, and then um, that's giving me decimals. That might be because I didn't go back and change my, um, why is it doing that? It's not working. It might be my settings, I think. So I'll jump back over here. It shouldn't be giving me that. Let's do it again. Shift and minus, and we'll just do, um, for example, sine of sine of x. Okay, so that will define uh, my function. Uh, sorry, that will differentiate my function. Sometimes you then want to go on and use the derivative, so you can now uh, define the derivative. So you might even say, let's call the derivative h of uh, h of x. Sorry, we'll just call that h of x. Use the assign command. And you can even just paste that down and say, I want the derivative of uh, sine x to be h of x. And now h of x is defined as cos x, which is really useful. So the other shortcut there is shift and uh, minus, sorry, shift and plus. And shift plus will bring up our integral um, shortcut. So that saves the kids a little bit of time in their exam as well, rather than going through, uh, as you know, 
they learn to go through menu and then calculus and then find the derivative. Yeah, look, uh, Harley, there. With the memory of that, what I tell my students is actually differentiate. You take one off the exponent, and with integration, you add one to the exponent. Don't you? Is a way of remembering, isn't it? To, to shift ah, plus, there shift we go. Minus. Shift plus and shift minus. Well, thanks, Rodney, because I always get those two mixed up. I always yeah, we'll do, on yeah. the wrong one. <laughs> That's a great little hint there. So, yep, adding one to the exponent, so shift plus to the integral. Fantastic. Um, while we're here, I might also just touch on the given that key. I, I used it earlier. Um, the given that key is really useful if we're, for example, subbing values into a derivative function. Uh, we know that we can use the menu calculus and derivative at a point, but we can also just ask the TI Inspire to evaluate h of x given that, and then we can type in something like x is equal to, uh, let's make it equal to something like, Sorry, x is equal to pi on 3, uh, and so the kids would be using the pi key, pi on 3, and that will substitute uh, the x value given there into the derivative function. So a mistake kids make is um, you know, subbing the x value into the original and then differentiating on their CAS. They tend to do that a little bit. So just get them to differentiate the function, assign the derivative function to be a new function, and you can call that anything. So you can even call it derivative of x um, and assign the derivative of x to be, um, you know, screwed up here. And now that has stored uh, derivative of x there. So that might be useful for the kids who get a little bit confused with h of x and g of x and f of x. Um, that might be useful too there. Now I'm going to insert a graph page here. I just want to show the function that the pages talk to one another. So if I insert a graph page here, and now I might uh, just type in h of x and my derivative function will show up there, which is really lovely. Uh, if the kids want to undo something they've just done, control z is the undo key, which is really nice. And also, they could just uh, graph, let's just graph sine of x. Okay, so there's our sine graph. If we press tab, that brings up this bar here. And we can just do shift minus, graph the derivative of f2 of x. Now the reason I've typed in f2 of x is because as soon as I uh, sketch that function, it has defined or assigned automatically that graph to be f2 of x. And if I um, click on that, there we go, we can see the original graph and the derivative uh, sketched or plotted, I should say, on the same graph. So this is a really lovely feature, uh, particularly when you're teaching derivatives, uh, getting the kids to play around with different different functions and then graphing their derivatives, uh, their derivative functions. So that's a really nice one as well. Okay, uh, with the graph, another little tip is changing the scale. I can't uh, can't tell you the number of times I've had students who plotted something like, uh, let's do e to the x plus 20. We're not going to be able to see it. And often the kids are zooming in, zooming out, which sometimes works, but it's not going to work had I plotted e to the x to the power of, uh, sorry, e to the x plus, you know, 2,000. They'll be zooming out for the whole period. So uh, some students use the zoom fit Okay, that's sort of, you know, if you're completely desperate, then you might use Zoom Fit and that will find some of the graphs usually for you. I'll just press Control Z now and undo that. Um, so, another way to do it is to get the students to, sorry, just put that back in there. Another way to do it is to get the students to have a think about, okay, well, our vertical translation was 20 units. So the reason we can't see it is because it's up here and they can actually just double click on this value here and uh, change that. So let's click 30 and there we go. Now if they want to uh, sort of navigate their way around the scale, they can change that value and then press tab and that will take them down to the x uh, axis. So we might make that 20, tab around again, tab around again and uh, then they can sort of 
fix their scale that way. So that's a really nice way to save time, uh, particularly the kids or the students who have some idea of where their graph is. Um, they can also delete things. So if I want to get rid of this thing here, it's a right click on the computer screen, but on the handheld that's control and menu. So control menu and we can just delete that. Um, so that's another little handy graphing tip. I'm just mindful that Peter Flynn might be taking over. Rodney, how are we going? Am I just going to keep going? Uh, Peter's experiencing some technical issues uh, and uh, won't be joining us tonight. So can you continue okay. on and finish off with the files? Do you need I a break certainly can. Or you... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's completely fine. Thanks. I just wanted to double check. Um, okay, so let's just get out of this question. And I'm going to actually bring up a... Uh, question that I gave, uh, I think this was year 11's maybe, it might have, uh, no it was year 12's in fact. So this is a question, I've used a notes page here, that's how I have an image in the middle of my uh, screen, but of course using the navigator, if you happen to have the navigator software, you can um, send these files wirelessly to your students. If you don't use the navigator, you can of course still transfer these files to your students' handheld using the, the cable. So this was a, a problem that we gave our students about sushi uh, and bacteria levels in the sushi and this was the um, function they were given, B of T equals A times to the KT and they were told that the tests show initially the level of bacteria present is 300 and after uh, 14 hours, the level of bacteria has risen to 38,400. So we can uh, use the CAS. Obviously, you'd expect them to be able to do this without just going straight to uh, the handheld. But they can see the points of 0, 300 and 14, 38,400. If I just insert a... Uh, page here, what I might do is assign my function and it was B of T equals, I'm just going to have to scoot back here, B of T equals A times 2 to the power of KT. So it was A times 2 to the power of K times T. Okay. I think it was, I think it was A times. A times, so, oh, exponential model, yeah. my apologies, my mistake. There we go, that's all right. Thanks for double checking on me. Uh, so if the students you know, have gotten as far as realising, okay, it's, it will be simultaneous equations. I mean, we can find um, one of them pretty easily because it goes through 0, 300. But we can now just type in solve B of 0 equals 300 and B of, uh, it was 14 hours, equals 13,000, sorry, 38,000. Uh, 400 and we're solving that for A and K. So um, what we're getting here is uh, solutions that are not working. What's going on here? What you could do, go check your settings while you're at it. So go check your mm. settings and um, mm. see what you've got there. So if you press What's the go to settings. Oh, okay. sorry, I've used uh, okay. What is going on here? Oh, I know what I've done. I've done something that the kids do all the time and I didn't assign. I equaled. There we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. And of course, I'd be demonstrating this for my students as to how to not freak out when you completely stuff something up. Uh, there we go. So we've got our A and our K values. And if you missed what I just uh, didn't do properly there, I had uh, not assigned B of T up here. I just used the equal sign instead of the assign command. So that's all fixed now. Now what I can do is uh, reassign it, I guess, with these values in it, or I can uh, just tell the CAS using the given that key that it's B of T and then say given that A equals 300 and given that K equals a half. But let's just reassign that now. So we've got A is 300 and K is a half and I'll use the little fraction tool up here. And 
I'd always get the kids to check, okay, so is B of 0, 0,300 and we're expecting B of 14 to be 38,400. Just get them in the habit of, of checking those values. So now I'm going to try and graph this thing. If I insert a graphs page here and I type in B of X, and you want to use B of X, not B of T. This is a perfect example where they're not going to be able to see anything. Uh, but we're expecting levels of 38,400 after 14 hours. So let's do uh, 55,000, might do it. And I might go up to, let's say 30. And that's a better looking graph um, here. So some really handy features in your uh, graphing page is that we can answer questions such as this one, find the amount of bacteria present after four hours. Give your answer to the nearest whole number. Now often kids don't realise that if they just use the trace uh, function, you just press trace, graph trace, and all. you don't need to sort of go to the left, go to the right and try and find four hours. You literally just type four, so I'll just type four and enter, and it will find the coordinates of that point there, which is really nice. And you just want to make sure that your students also have their settings showing a nice high float in the actual graphs page because these settings are different to the settings that we uh, looked at before. So once they're in a graph page, um, just get them to go into menu and settings and make sure that they've got the right settings up there as well. Okay, because we've learned that these pages talk to one another, uh, we could have just evaluated B of 4 over here and seen you know, the levels at 1,200 as well, but it's nice for them to check both. It's really nice when the students have a bit of a, a visual as well. So um, that's one of the, the pluses, I guess, of having a TI Inspire. Okay, the next question was, Mr. Yamamoto has done some research and has found that levels of bacteria up to 5,400 are safe for uh, human consumption. So how long after it's prepared to the nearest minute is he safe to serve his sushi rolls? So this is another way that's really nice to demonstrate to the kids uh, both on the, the graph and in a uh, calculator page. So what I'd do is get them to put in a, another function that is 5,400 and that's of course just going to be a horizontal line and now we can see uh, where the, the function exceeds 5,400 and if we go into menu and uh, analyse graph and intersection we'll be able to find the coordinates of that intersection point. And I'm getting so many decimal places here because my float's up nice and high on, um, on, my, on my settings. So make sure that the kids do that, otherwise this is going to round to you know, 8.34. Uh, and if it's asked to three decimal places, they're going to be a little bit stuck, aren't they? Um, in this case, I think it did ask for the nearest hour, so we're not too fussed about that. Um, now what I did want to show was that you can also do that in a calculator page. So if we press Control I, we go into a calculator page, we can solve where B of T. Now we wanted to know where it sort of exceeds uh, 5,400. So we might want to know for how, for how long he can uh, serve it is when it's less than 5,400. And this will give us um, the exact value there because our settings were set to auto and we can just press control enter. And you'll see that that is the same value that came up before um, came up before on our graph screen. So that's really nice. So just doing these kinds of questions with the students is really lovely. Um, getting them to use their, their calculator graph page and their calculator calculator page as well and, and using those together. Remind them uh, that... Hayley, sorry to interrupt, Hayley. Yeah. How are you going, mate? You've had a long session so far. Do you want me to show anything at all? Are you happy to continue? Do you need a little break? No, no, I'm all right. I'm all right. Sure. Thanks, okay. Robbie. If you're happy, I'm happy. Yep. <laughs> if one question has been um, asked, that possibly that um, maybe you could show how to calculate the bounded area between two um, yep. graphs. That's good. I was so just about good. to do that. So yeah. I'm going to do that one. <laughs> Perfect. I'll, yep, I'll, I'll, just, I'll do it. that now. Um, just before I do bounded area, I just wanted to mention... Uh, 
with the pages that are all open now, so you can see I'm going to have plenty if I look, I uh, encourage your students not to clear them out when, they, when they're in the middle of their uh, exam. So if they're sort of halfway through extended answer question two and they're getting a bit stuck or you know, frustrated, they should just leave all of that working there and just go into another problem so that you know, 10 minutes into the, the next question, if they decide, okay, I'm ready to face question three again, they can go back. So that was sort of the purpose of having all the different, um, the different problems open. Okay, I will uh, show bounded area. Thanks for that suggestion, Rodney. What I'll do is just insert a, a new page here and we'll insert a graph. Let's do maybe uh, x squared minus, um, minus 4 and something like uh, 2x, uh, let's do a half x minus 1. Okay, so we'll do a half x minus 1. Now, if you have 3.9 software or later, uh, you'll have this function, which is bounded area. If you have anything before 3.9, uh, or if your students do, they won't actually have this as an option. So it's this option here, uh, analyze graph and bounded area. And if you hover over the intersection point here, it will pick up that value and then we'll hover over here and pick up that value as well, which is a really nice way um, to show the student's bounded area. Now, I'll just undo that, so control well, Z. Well, showing, isn't it great how it actually um, showed it as the positive because the most teachers all up here mm. in Queensland from Australia they do about upper function minus lower function, and if they do it the other way around, mm. the bounded area would be negative, so it's great it comes out to be positive. Yeah, yeah, that's it's really fantastic, um, and it's nice when you're teaching, when you're teaching it. So a couple of weeks ago it was for me, but showing the students um, visually, you know, the area and, it, and how it shades it is really lovely as well. Mm. So they didn't have to be in that. This case, the one I just did, it was the area between the two uh, intersection points, so the bounded between the two graphs there. But we can uh, type in just bounded area um, between two values. So I could type in say negative 1 and, I don't know, uh, 2.4 or 2.5, and it will actually evaluate that bounded area as well. So that's really nice um, if the question wasn't just, you know, bounded between the two intersection points. Um, it might say find the area bound between these curves, between the points x equals, and the lines x equals 1 and x equals, sorry, negative 1 and 2.5, and you can just put your, um, your values in there. So that's that's another really lovely function on the graph pages. So um, I might move away from the graph now. Um, I've got about 15 minutes left and I wouldn't mind just showing a little bit of the notes pages because I think as Peter Flynn would say, they're an untapped resource and a dynamic untapped resource if I'm uh, channeling Peter Flynn. So I'll just show you this one. This is one that I sent to my year 12 this morning actually. Um, we were doing normal distribution and I've set up this notes page so that uh, I can change the values in here. Now don't worry too much. I will show you in just a moment how to actually create one of these. It looks far more complex than it actually is. But I thought it would be good to show you what you can do with them once they're set up before I just show you how to, to make them. So this is obviously for the normal distribution. We were having a bit of a chat about uh, study scores actually. So we said the um, standard deviation, I just said it was approximately 6.5. Um, and what I've done is set up the uh, function here, which is of course a normal distribution uh, equation. And in the next page, it is graphing uh, the normal curve, which is really, really lovely. So if I were to come back in here and change my question, maybe I want to look at a normal distribution with a mean of, uh, let's say, 15 and a standard deviation of, uh, let's say it's 10, then we'll jump back over here and you can see that my graph has in fact uh, moved, which is really lovely. I'll just get rid of that area. and. These dynamic uh, notes pages are a really lovely thing for your kids or your students, I should say, to have on their handheld because if they're stuck in a sack or maybe in the exam 
Um, this is a nice little way to prompt them. Uh, this is another sort of page that I've set up where we can enter in the mean and the standard deviation or the variance here, putting in variance. And then we can find, okay, for a distribution with a variance of 30 and a mean of 20, that's a bit higher, let's make that a bit lower. Uh, and then we can say, okay, what's the probability of getting um, a, a score between maybe 19 and 20.5? And as I'm changing these values, you can see the probability changing down here. And you can set these up for all sorts of problems. I've got um, a continuous probability one set up here. I uh, did this with my students earlier in the week where we've uh, defined a function. The example I used was log to the base e between 1 and e, but I could change that now. So let's do something like uh, x on 12 x on 12 given that x is between a and b and I'll change these values here to 1 and 5 and what I've got this doing is setting up a little check to make sure that the area under the function is in fact 1 which is really nice um, for the students you know that they'll realize if they've put a different value in here and then it automatically plots the graph so before I'd changed that we had a plot of the log function on this next page, but they're dynamic pages, so they're talking to one another, and, um, and, and this has automatically graphed that. Now, in the third page, I've set it up to calculate the mean, the variance, and the standard deviation for any uh, continuous probability density function, which is really, really lovely. So take note of those numbers there, 3.4, etc. If we jump back in, as I showed you before, and we change this, function and we'll just change it back to what it was. Sorry, almost typed in the wrong E there. We were going to have all sorts of issues. And then if we jump back over here, it's calculated without me doing anything, the mean and the variance and the standard deviation. So I'm aware of the time. I'm not going to go through all of these notes pages, but I've set up, um, here's another one for binomial probability. Um, and I'll just briefly touch on how to create one of these these notes pages. I was about to say that, um, Hayley, if you're taking yeah. breath, you're doing a wonderful job. Some people may not to be sure for the notes application how to set up a simple yeah. one to get them started yeah. possibly, but that's yeah. great watching um, what you're doing. I might do that quickly now. I'll just do something, um, let's do average value of a function because that's another one we can do really, really nicely. And it's a nice one to teach your students how to um, use this as well. So I'll just open a new document. Now, on the list here, and the notes pages is this one here, number six, and um, you can type anything. So, hello everyone. Okay, that's uh, just me typing. I might just type in average value of a function here. Obviously, with the students, they take a little bit longer to type on the on the handheld. And what I'll do is insert what's called a math box here. At the moment, I'm just typing text. If I want to insert any mathematical uh, sort of working out, I need to insert a math box. So what I'll do is insert Control M. Sorry, is I'll type Control M, and I might just uh, assign my function. So let's choose a function. Maybe we'll do the average value of. Let's do something nice and easy. X squared uh, plus three. Okay. Now, when we're evaluating average value, we know that we need uh, a lower and an upper limit, if you like. So we usually call the lower one A and the upper one B. And I'm just typing in some values here. I can go in and change them. So if I want to change that value, changes to a three. Now, we know that the average value is equal to one over B minus A times the integral from A to B of F of X. So that's exactly what we're going to type in this little math box. Now, if your math box disappears at any stage, you just press Control M and a math box will appear. So I'm going to call this average value. You can name it whatever you'd like. And I'm going to assign the average value to be 1 over B minus A times the integral. Now, Rodney, let's see if I can get this right. We're going to add one. There we go. <laughs> the integral from A to B of F of X dx. So all I've done there is typed in the average value formula in terms of f of x and a and b. And if I now press enter, 
that's telling me the average value of that function between 3 and 5. If I would prefer that as a decimal, I just jump in there and press Control Enter. And Control Enter again will change it back to the exact value, which is really lovely. So why is this useful? Well, let's imagine your students get into their exam and it asks for the average value of uh, sine x between pi on 12 and pi on now let's do and pi. Okay, so I've just gone in here. Now you need to make sure that they're pressing enter, which is what I didn't do. There we go, press enter. And that automatically, it's dynamic, so it automatically evaluates the average value. And as I said before, control enter will uh, change that to a decimal if we're just in here, control and enter. So I went quite quickly only because I'm, I'm mindful of the time there. But, Yep. Could you actually just show people how to access it through the menu as well? So sort of the shortcut is Control M for the math box, but if you just show people through the menu icon. Uh, yes, I didn't actually um, show that because I never do it. Thanks, Rodney. So we can insert a math box rather than Control M. I've just found it. You can just jump out of here. So if we want a math box down here, we just go to Menu and there's Insert and there's uh, Math Box there, so I'll just type on that as well, so that's really handy. So basically, what you need to do if you're setting up these uh, pages is think about the things that, the, the parameters that would uh, change in a question. So if it was a binomial probability question, for example, then you would want to have your number of trials and your probability of success uh, listed as, as different um, parameters here, so you'd have N and P uh, assigned, and then you could insert, I'll just jump over here, then you could insert uh, various rules. So this is um, one that I've set up previously, and that's exactly what I did. I've got the number of trials and the probability and the X value I'm looking for, and then I've set this up, and now we could call this really anything, you could call it prob it doesn't really matter, uh, it will work it out for you here. And if we go in and change our number of trials to 30, then we can see the, the uh, probability changing there. Likewise, we can uh, change the probability of success to whatever we want, really, um, and, and it will change the probability. So, look, I, I'm not saying set these up so that your students, you know, only use the notes pages in their exam. We all know that they can access all of these functions just on a normal calculator page. Uh, so if we had a normal calculator page up, we'd be going into menu and probability distributions, and then we'd be looking at you know binomial PDF and, and typing in our values there. Of course they can do that, and, and I certainly show my students how to do that as well. Um, but this is a particularly nice if they are a little bit weaker, um, and they might just need some prompting, because they can type in whatever notes uh, this is for a question, you know, when the probability is independent um, of the previous outcome, for example. So they could actually have notes typed in here, um, and when they get stuck on a question like that, they can sort of refer to those in their exam, which is lovely. So I am aware of the time. I'm just going to scoot across here. Um, this is a picture of some of my students. There's a lot of them in there, because this is at a morning class that is optional, so they've come in, you can see they're using the little uh, yellow hats there, they're using the navigator, and, sorry, this is a, a couple of photos of the kids doing group work, so um, in a lesson, I think it was last week, they actually got their sacks back, we gave them all the, the questions again, and they just worked in groups together going through the tech active questions, and it was amazing uh, what came out of those uh, discussions, um, it, was, it was really it was really valuable because you know you sort of think oh, I've shown you all how to do this uh, a million times, but um, when they're teaching each other and saying oh did you do that and and also it it helps when their settings aren't right because one student's CAS or one student's handheld will show something and another student's handheld might show something else um, and yeah it's just a, a really lovely way to get them working. On the uh, on the handhelds, just working in groups. So that is.
all from me, Rodney. Sorry if I rushed a little bit at the end there, but I thought the, the notes pages was certainly something that was worthwhile showing um, leading into the exam. Definitely. That was very well done. Hayley, what a fantastic webinar. Your first webinar it was magnificent. I and I'm sure other attendees learnt new skills to use for students. I definitely learnt some new skills. That's why I watch these webinars and look at the recordings. Now, if you as an attendee would like to actually see or view the recordings that you've seen tonight and other webinars, if you visit the uh, education.ti.com Australian website, you'll see on the home page there are the webinars. So if you select that and in here they'll show you the upcoming webinars. So you see tonight, Haley was here and then Peter unfortunately couldn't make it tonight due to technical difficulties and you'll see that's coming up in the tomorrow night. There's uh, Russell Brown and Brian Lennon doing the exam readiness for further mathematics and this goes on. There's plenty coming up over the next few weeks preparing teachers for their students and their classes. Now, all webinars are recorded and you'll see that if you click on the On Demand tab, you'll see the recorded webinars and an extensive list. Now, you can play the webinar online or you can download it and view it at a later time and you can also download the associated documents. So presenters like Haley had her TNS files, PowerPoints, all those files are there that you could readily download. So as you actually scroll through, there's many there. So Haley again, thank you very much for that. What a wonderful webinar. And um, until next time, and as if you haven't registered for the uh, upcoming webinars, the one tomorrow night with uh, Russell and Brian. So those who are attending tonight, log on again and actually select to attend tomorrow night. So until next time, take care. And again, thank you very much, Haley. Thanks, Rodney.